How you guys doing? This is Rick uh, and Cole coming to you from Tobacco Grove on another Cigars from Afar. And today we are joined with two guests. We've got Michael Herklotz and Kylie Boudreaux from Nat Sherman Cigars. How you guys doing? What's happening? What's going on, guys? Go before we start getting into it, I know uh, we've all got some really kick-ass cigars right now that we're about to light up. And uh, before I tell people what it is, and we're going to get into it later, so I don't want to steal the story from later, but Kylie, what, what are we going to be smoking today? We are going to be smoking the brand new Timeless Limited Edition TAA 2020. Outstanding. Michael, how many of these have you had so far? Uh, at the risk of making people jealous, I, I'm, I'm afraid <laughs> to say, um, I can tell you that, that the actual finished with the band on, I've probably only had uh, four or five. Um, certainly leading up to it, uh, I had the opportunity to smoke a lot of them in different sizes and different configurations. Um, but finished, finished, final good, band and everything, maybe just four or five. Okay. So we, we really, we, we didn't make that many. At the end of the day, we made um, 650 of these uh, mazos that's only 6,500 cigars, and um, you know the idea is obviously to sell them. So, right. That that limits that limits my available inventory, unfortunately. Right. So we have five less to sell. That's what I got again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, Cole and I are going to start. We're lighting this up actually for the first time. So this is going to be. I love the black band on this. The the the, the packaging black. On black it yeah. looks sweet, doesn't it? I have to tell you, so we've we've played around with this black on black idea for a long time, but to actually execute it, it was probably one of the most difficult bands I've ever done because black on black on different papers with different treatments, you can't read it, you can't see it. So then we realized we really had to go almost gray on black. Mm, sure. And so then we had to alternate between whether the background was gray versus the font gray, glossy versus, it really, I, I can't tell you how many um, iterations of that band we did just to get it right, um, but it came out awesome. So yeah, it was worth it. all the work. Steve Silvestri is our creative director. And um, I mean, I, I can tell you, we, were, we, we, we probably three or four trips to, to the DR um, were, were spent some of that time obviously working on this and it was one of the most frustrating processes because you think <laughs> it was it was perfect and it just didn't work but we finally got it to work and it's killer. What, what I think is unique about this is it's different than the, the majority of the other Nat Sherman uh, you know logos and, and brands on here. This is a little bit more edgy and typically with Nat Sherman, it's very classic, very elegant, et cetera. And this is a little bit more aggressive. I like it. I think, I mean, if, if you look at the work we did um, when we did that sort of portfolio rebrand uh, a few years ago, um, the, we tried to maintain the, the, the feel and spirit of all the brands and just try and, and modernize them a touch. Um, but obviously a company like ours, we're, we're in our 90th year um, we also don't want to be inauthentic. So, you know, we are 90 years old. We, we're, we're not skull and crossbones and, uh, you know, that just doesn't fit who we are and what we do. So really finding that, that, that balance of um, nostalgia, authenticity, but also still being relevant and hip, I think we certainly achieved that with this particular motif. Now, a lot of people, when, when you think about Nat Sherman cigars, the image comes to mind of obviously the clock and, and New York City, et cetera. And obviously New York right now with what's going on with, with COVID-19, it's, it's, it's been very, very, very difficult is, is uh, not even the way to say it. How has it been? I know you're in New Jersey right now. Is that correct? I'm in New Jersey. Um, I went to the store last week just to do a check-in on the facilities. Um, you know, I'll tell you, I was, I was surprised and encouraged, to be honest, when I went to the city. Um, there was a lot more action than I thought there would be. Um, and I also found my, I, I took a bunch of pictures and, and posted some on, on my Facebook and Instagram. And I found myself posting the photos that appeared the most desolate 
because obviously those are the photos that you'd want to see that are that are you know so unique. Sure. Um, so I realized I was perpetuating the same message that probably every other media source is doing. You don't post the picture of traffic and people. We see that right. all the time. Um, but I will tell you, it, it gave me uh, it gave me a real sense um, of relief to see that there was still action, that life was going on, um, clearly very different, less people, masks, um, and this was before the requirement of masks even. Um, but you know, it, it it does give me a lot of hope that that the spirit of the city um, is alive and well. Obviously, we are dealing with um, a, a pandemic um, at a level that I think you know few places on the globe have experienced. Um, but then to also see the the clear resiliency of New York, um, you know just like any other major catastrophe that we've faced as a city, um, you know, we, we faced it seriously, but also um, with, with that sense of, of camaraderie and we will get through this. Um, so, you know, it's been tough. We closed our store um, voluntarily one week prior to it being required. Um, the, the, the governor had basically said, um, for non-essential businesses to consider closing. Uh, and so we, we took that as a serious cue um, to, to do it. Um, so we're entering week six now of uh, being closed and social distancing. Um, our wholesale business um, has now, I think entering now week five or maybe week six um, of remote working um, we're very fortunate to have a very small team um, still working two days a week sure. uh, in our North Carolina facility. So we're processing our orders remotely and, and preparing them remotely. And then two days a week, we're picking, packing, and shipping. And I couldn't be more grateful for those folks who are showing up and, uh, and doing that work. Um, and so, you know, obviously, our, our business has been affected. Um, but you know, I'm awfully, I'm awfully encouraged by the business we continue to do. Um, you know, it, we, unfortunately, our store cannot operate at all. Um, but to the extent that stores can operate differently and safely today, whether it's curbside pickups or grab and go or any of that kind of stuff, um, right. you know, it's certainly encouraging to see, and we certainly see it just with our volumes that um, that stores are really looking for our support. They need product to sell. Right. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're fortunate that we have good inventory levels, that we have people that can pick back and ship product. And so, you know, we've been, and Kylie, I think will certainly attest to it. We obviously, we are not picking up the phone, calling our retail partners saying, hey man, you know, do you have an order for me? That's not <laughs> what we're doing. What, what we're really trying to do is call our partners and say, what can we do to help you? If you need product, we'll get you product. If you need bags and matches, we'll get you bags and matches. Anything we can do to support you and keep you in business or help prop you back up when you're ready to go, that's, sure. what, that's what we're gonna do. We've, we've been in business 90 years and we have not been in business 90 years by uh, taking advantage of our partners. We've right. been in business 90 years because we take partnership seriously. Cool. And I think that's you, you very a, evident these last five weeks. You hit a great, uh, a great note, Michael, because it, like what you said, um, we actually went to curbside to go uh, early on before we were mandated to, to even shut down, et cetera. We, we specifically went to that. It was about, I think about a two week period we just said, you know what, we can still give that customer interaction to people. So that's what we did. And then Kylie was wonderful because we yeah. spoke with her and she said, hey, you know what, how can we help you guys out? You know, let's run some promotions if you want. And you guys were one of the few companies that sent us out bags, matches, et cetera. And it's been yeah. wonderful to be able to get that. So we really appreciate that. Oh, cool. Ooh. We were thinking it was, that, it was that first week 
And, um, you know, there were all these amazing, like great American stories of response. So, you know, factories making masks, factories making ventilators, um, wineries and, and uh, uh, breweries making sanitizer, you know, and, and we were on a call like, we can't do any of those things. What, what, is, what does that look like for our business? What is something people need today that they're running out of that's gonna be in short supply? And we had just gotten in our shipment of our bags and our, our cutters and stuff. And we said, man, you know, this is probably the time where people need that stuff most. And, you know, we can't make hand sanitizer and we can't make ventilators, but we can package this stuff up and just send it to people who need it. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's simple, but I think it was certainly um, well received, certainly helpful for people. And we, I, I feel really grateful that we could do something. I think it helped a lot in the short time that we were able to, when we had it, we had it for about a week, you know, with the asterisks and stuff, a lot of people took advantage of it too. And it was really cool to have somebody actually reach for a, maybe a product that they don't know a whole lot about, but they had everything that they needed. They had the matches, we had the ashtrays, we had everything that go through it was on the bag and it was yeah. sanitary, the number one thing when we walked it out to cars on, uh, on curbside. Well, Michael, let me ask you a question. So what, um, what is your history in the industry? I know, like I said, I've, I've, I've seen in advertisements, you know, just meeting you today, you know, kind of touch on a little bit of your, your history in, in the industry. Uh, I started, I was fortunate. It was the, the legal age to smoke was 18. Um, I, I smoked my first cigar when I was 18. When I got to college, I went to Berkeley College of Music in Boston. Uh, smoked my first cigar while I was there. Found it incredibly interesting. I'd never smoked anything in my life before. And I just, I, 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 can, I can remember vividly uh, walking into this cigar bar in Boston as a non-smoker um, and just thinking, this is just a, it's a different world. Oh, yeah. um, I, I tried a cigar. Um, I took a few puffs of my, of my roommate. It was an Ashton Classic. And, uh, and I just remember thinking it was, it was um, a behavior I'd never done. It was a flavor I'd never tasted. It was a, um, it was a medium I'd never experienced being smoked. Um, and it was just, it was fascinating. And as an artist, um, you know, we, we tend to get a little cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs when, when <laughs> we're exposed to something that, that, that we like. And, and um, you know, we, artists have this constant need to explore and, and go down the, the, the rabbit holes. Um, and so that was certainly me on the cigar side of things, but I didn't have any money. So, uh, you know, how do, how do you go down the rabbit hole of premium cigars as a broke musician college student? Um, so I, I got a job and there was a, um, a kiosk in the mall um, and a kid that worked there was graduating and he lived on my floor in the dorm. And so I went to him, his name was Phil. And I was like, Phil, you got to get me this job. And he did. And so I started working there when I was 19 that summer after my first year of college. And I, I worked there, uh, that store sold pretty quickly after I joined. And the guy that bought it basically said, I don't have time to run this. I need you to run it. Uh, I didn't have time to run it. So he, he wasn't interested in hearing that part. He just said, you know, <laughs> you have to figure it out. So I got a bunch of friends and, and, and we all worked, uh, you know, quick shifts and in between classes and, and uh, ran that for three years. We closed in, um, it was just before 9-11, I guess, um, which was good timing because we were in a tower. So um, that obviously was negatively affected after, um, but we closed uh, and opened up a proper store outside of the city, which... I, I wasn't interested in because this was the perfect kind of job to work and learn, but also go to school and do all the things I wanted to do as a musician. So I took some couple months off um, and was still visiting uh, a local store in town called Gloucester Street Cigar Company, which really an amazing old school tobacconist, uh, no longer there, unfortunately. And so I ended up working there um, for a few months, um, Probably the, the last part of 2001 into 2002, I graduated in uh, May of 2002, moved to New York City with, with plans of working as a musician. Um, and I knew the manager of the Davidoff store at the time, 
Um, and so he hired me in June of 2002 for retail sales. And I did retail sales um, through 2006 as a sales associate. Um, 2006, Davidoff bought uh, a store on the west side in Columbus Circle. And they moved me there and put me there as the general manager of that business. So I ran that business 2006 to 2008. And then in 2008, um, the manager of the Madison Avenue store who hired me left. Uh, he actually went to Holtz in Philadelphia. And so they created a, a new job basically and, and put me in charge of both. And so I ran the West Side store and the Madison Avenue store through June of 2011 uh, when I left to join that chairman. Now, what musical instrument do you play, Michael? Drums. Really? Nice. nice. Which some will argue is not a musical instrument. No, but, it absolutely is. Oh, baloney, that's totally a musical instrument. Man. Absolutely. I would agree. It's not a melodic instrument, but it's certainly a musical instrument. So, so Kylie, talk to us just briefly a little bit about how you got into the industry as well. Uh, so 2000, this must have been 2011, I was living downtown Indianapolis, and I was working at a Walgreens store. And the, uh, the grocery store manager, her husband was co-owner of a cigar bar uh, downtown. And uh, I asked her, because I had seen a Craigslist on, ad online, and I was like, hey, I'm like, I saw this. I know that your husband's co-owner. Can you put in a word for me? She's like, no, I won't. <laughs> I was like, well, all right. So I ended up getting the job anyway. And about a year later, Blend was getting ready to open uh, up on the north side of Indy. And uh, I waited on one of the owners. He's like, you got to come and work for us. I had already had bourbon knowledge at that point, wine, cocktails, uh, a little bit of cigar knowledge. Um, but I was like, yeah, I'll come see your little fancy lounge that you're making. Little did I know it's one of the nicer lounges in the country. Right. Um, so I was working there and uh, the Nat Sherman 85th anniversary cigar release party was at Blend. And I believe it was two days before they released it at the townhouse. Um, yeah. And that's where I met Michael. And Michael says that I told him that night that I was interested in the industry and I wanted to be a rep and blah, 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 blah. And I guess I added him on Facebook the next day. So, <laughs> so when it came time and the job became available, I applied for it. And I guess I'm a memorable person. And so I've been with, uh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this past Wednesday was my two years with the company. So congratulations. Um, thank yeah. you. Happy yeah. anniversary. Yeah. Thanks. So, they haven't fired me yet. So <laughs> <laughs> even during I'm these sure difficult <laughs> times too, right? It's a perfect scapegoat. Um, and talk to us a little bit about Michael, the, the history of Nat Sherman. Um, like you said, it goes back 90 years. It's, it's an iconic brand in the industry. Talk a little bit about, about that for the, the viewers who may not know the history. So Nat Sherman person first, obviously, um, and uh, was not a, a tobacco guy. He actually, um, back in the late 1920s, um, ran a speakeasy with his, with his brother um, in Queens. Um, but uh, in the late 1920s, he found himself the proud owner of a cigar factory in Manhattan called Schwab Brothers and Bear. We believe um, he acquired the factory through some sort of a poker debt. Un unclear whether the factory was put up as a wager or whether they didn't pay and the factory was taken as payment. <laughs> Nevertheless, he ended up owning a cigar factory with absolutely no knowledge of uh, cigars. Oh, that's got to be, just to interrupt you, that's got to be one of the coolest startups of a cigar company, period. That's yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the brands made in that factory at the time was the brand Epoca, or Epoca, as we typically say in English. Um, and so fast forward a little, in the in very end of 1929, they were building 1400 Broadway, which at the time was a was a, a flagship tower being built in the garment district, and um, one of the developers um, ran into some money issues, and went to Nat for uh, help with a loan to finish this building, and as part of that deal, um, gave Nat the lobby shop of 1400 Broadway, which Nat knew about as much about retail as he did about the cigar business, but figured 
I'll at least take the cigars that we're making over here and we'll sell them in this shop along with anything else. His wife was into imported chocolate, so they sold chocolates. Uh, and then what you typically find in a lobby shop, magazines, cigarettes, newspapers, candy. Um, but what's important about that is in, in a profound example of humility, he put Nat Sherman, his name, over the front door, which is important because that is the moment when Nat Sherman became an experience. It wasn't just a person anymore. Nat right. Sherman became a place, it became a brand, it became an experience. So it wasn't long after that that Nat decided, you know, why am I selling products that are other brands? I want to sell products that are my brand. So brands like Epoca started to phase out and Nat Sherman started to become the brand on um, the cigars that he was selling, in addition, of course, to the, the leading brands of the era. Um, so really, that, that's where the, the brand was born, was out of a retail store and this desire to serve and accommodate customers. In the 1950s, um, a customer was told he could no longer smoke um, cigars on uh, airplanes. Of course, it was fully permissible to smoke cigarettes, just not cigars anymore. So he went to Nat and said, can you make me a cigarette that tastes like the cigars um, that I typically buy from you so I can continue to smoke on planes? Sure. And Nat said, sure. He had never made a cigarette before, but he said, yeah, why not? So he started making cigarettes using Cuban tobacco at the time, which the cigars were made of Cuban tobacco at the time. And also used a, uh, a brown paper, so it still kind of looked like a, like a cigar, um, tasted familiar like a cigar, and that's how Nat Sherman entered into the cigarette business into the 50s. He also made them like cigars were made, although short filler, but um, you know, no additives, no, didn't have all these other things, it was just, it was just leaf. Um, and so we entered into the cigarette business at that time into the, in the 50s, um, and the cigarette business really became uh, a wildly successful business, sure. um, as was the retail business. And then that uh, also expanded with the idea of catalogs and mail order and expanding the access and availability of the products from his sort of uh, famous store in the garment district to, to then be able to buy it through catalog and, and, um, and through phone sale. So that really grew through the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, in 1976, Nat decided he was going to move the store to Fifth Avenue, which if you can imagine, 1976, you could buy cigarettes, cigars, tobacco in any store. S tobacco is not a luxury item in, 19, in the 1970s. Right. Um, so the idea of opening a specifically tobacco store on Fifth Avenue and 55th Street, which is across from the St. Regis, diagonal from the Peninsula Hotel, uh, across from the Metropolitan Club or one of those clubs. I mean, it's sure. just mind boggling that, uh, and most recently, Polo Rob Lauren was in that space. So sure. just imagine what this building is. He decides to put a tobacco store there. That was a, an absolutely crazy idea, but Nat really believed that the idea of premium cigars and, and premium uh, uh, tobacco products should be elevated at a luxury level like Tiffany two blocks away. And so he did it. Uh, and I think, I think arguably that move changed the perspective of what premium tobacco products and, and premium retail for tobacco products really meant. Um, in 1990, Nat died and uh, his son, Joel, took over the business. Joel relocated the store to 42nd Street and Fifth Avenue. One of the things he did that was so amazing um, is in the 7,000 square feet that was the store, which that alone, crazy. Um, I'd say probably 5,000 of that um, was really committed to seats and space to enjoy the product. So even in 1990, you could smoke nearly anywhere. Um, the idea that you would actually stick around a retail store and smoke a cigar was, was really um, not in the, the lexicon of behavior of cigar consumers. Cigar consumers 
purchase cigars at a place where you bought cigars, consume cigars at a place where you consume cigars, at a bar or a restaurant or any other social environment. But Joel really thought it was important to, to um, elevate the idea of the retail experience to include consumption, which today you look at our business, if you don't have a place as a retailer for a consumer to enjoy the product they purchased, you're not long for the industry. Um, that was really part of, of the guiding principle of what the Nat Sherman experience became beginning in 1990. So really that was pioneered that idea by Joel Sherman. Um, we relocated the store in 2007 to the, to where we are today. Um, and, uh, but in that time, obviously the cigar boom occurred and the cigar boom was a great thing for our industry, but also um, a challenging time because you had, pe you had people who wanted to enter the industry. You had uh, a soar in, in volume and, and um, uh, you, you couldn't meet the same volumes from a manufacturing standpoint. So you had quality going down, prices going up. Um, and, and the Shermans basically said, they, they couldn't keep up with demand and keep up with quality. So what they, what they basically did was decide to try and preserve their production and volumes with the partners they had manufacturing. Um, they knew they couldn't increase. And so they basically only supplied their store. For better or worse, um, that, that kept the brand growth from the premium cigar side of our business relatively small. Um, and so once we got to the other side of the boom, 2001, 2002, um, Nat Sherman probably did not have the recognition that a lot of brands had um, that grew on the growth curve of the cigar boom. So that entered uh, a period that was a, a bit of a quiet period, I think, for our premium cigar business. Um, and ultimately, in an effort to grow it, the Shermans entered into an agreement um, for a third party to take over some of the sales and the distribution. At that time, our cigarette business was incredible. So our field sales force was focusing solely on the cigarette business. We were vertical at that time in the cigarette business. Um, so it made more sense to focus on what we could control and then find a partner to help us on the cigar side. And um, so we're certainly grateful for the work that that, um, company did that was Santa Clara. Um, so they had a wholesale company, a, a distribution company. They also had a retail company, which is JR Cigars. Mm -hmm. And so the inevitable evolution then became um, for the product to be sold through the channels that were available. Obviously that included um, catalog and internet. And that was the time where really it was the advent of, uh, of e-com. Um, and so you had a lot of competition for price. Um, and so our products were ultimately discounted um, as many products of that era were. Right. And um, not being present in brick and mortar stores because we didn't have the volume or the sales force to do it. We basically became um, a de facto catalog brand. Um, not for better or worse, only as the sort of natural evolution of of the brand went. So in 2011, the Shermans decided that it was time to really reshift some focus to the cigar business and see if we couldn't um, um, start a uh, new phase and new chapter. So I joined in 2011 and that really was focused solely on um, our retail store in Manhattan, which we started calling the townhouse in 2011, uh, as well as redeveloping the wholesale business. So we, we started, I joined in a full time in June. Um, we had about a three month transition as I was transitioning out of Davidoff. We were moving the store at that time. There was a lot going on. So transitioning out of Davidoff and into Nat Sherman, but we moved incredibly quickly. And um, uh, we ultimately released the first Timeless Collection in 2012. And then from there, um, we did a lot of product development, um, 2012 with Timeless from Dominican, then Nicaragua, then 1930 in Sterling later on, 
um, we started adding people. So we added um, one person, I think, in 2012, 2013, we added one more. Um, so, you know, we were very lean, very scrappy. Um, you know, it was, it was an 80-year-old startup, basically, in 2011. <laughs> um, and then slowly adding people, adding products. Uh, we've grown to where we are today.